he's a very enthusiastic citizen scientist. <laughs> yes. So he is going to um, talk. Maybe you can, like, in, in one minute, talk about the. Go ahead and get a cookie. Yeah. I saw that. I thought you were over. Um, well, let me just quickly tell you uh, while he's eating the cookie. Um, so when I met Paul in, in 91, 92, yes. around that, at that time, um, he, um, by him, um, so he's been an avid birder for many, many years, and so when I first met him, he had these metal boxes with index cards. And every time we went out birding, because we've been together since 93, every time we went out birding, he would write down the location, the temperature, he'd write all these data on these, and then write down every particular species that we saw and the number. And then he went, went back home and then filed it away. And so we have, for many, for a couple, more than a couple decades now, moved around with these little crates, these, uh, these little um, boxes, index boxes. <laughs> Are you able to say first? Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Just and, um, <laughs> and so then it moved on to, we got very excited because the American Birding Association created these books, these little paper books. And so we could go and keep track in there. And so on the side, there's a little line, though, next to the one. So you to, every time we saw that, we were writing down what we'd seen. It wasn't quite efficient. And all of our field guides on the side, he'd written down, you know, in pencil. So it wasn't quite right. And then there was some, wasn't there some website that you could at least, like an Excel sheet type of thing? It was like a spreadsheet. So he was keeping track of all these. Yeah, there were various database programs that you could manage your checklists and manage your, like, various lists, your, your right. world lists, your country list, your state list, your county list. Right, cetera, so you're, yes, and he has many of these lists. And so, and then, uh, I just want to, I also need to say that he also manages my list. So I, I'm a birder, but I'm not a lister. Um, I, I, my personal interpretation is that there are more men are listers than there are women. I don't think not. Not. <laughs> uh, you don't think so? I don't think he thinks that because he sees a few women out there, so he thinks that they must be listing. I don't think they are. But anyway, but I will, we won't go into that right now. But then Eber came along, and now it's really exciting because now you can see it. It's like a database that keeps track, and you can see what other people are seeing, and you can go and find whether there's some interesting birds that are not on your list. Like if you have a life list or a year list or a, he has a county list or a state list, you know, he can say, oh, I haven't, this is a, I haven't seen this in the county. Or we, like, or we went to, we saw an American Dipper over, I don't know, Christmas winter break, and then he was like, oh, I don't have this in my state list. I'm very excited. You know, even though we just, we are indicative of good water quality. Oh, is that right? Oh, yeah. okay. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was the first thing we did in Colorado. That was exciting. Yeah. Okay, anyway, so go ahead and show your... So, yeah, so um, <laughs> when, when Mina was twisting my arm to come over here and, and do this... No, he didn't. I didn't like, think like the card. I said as he came over. And I, I was thinking, <laughs> okay, how... I mean, I mean, so I guess I'll first apologize and that this is not a polished presentation like Greg just gave. No, I just said... But, yeah. uh, <laughs> but anyways, um, but I, I guess the way that I'll kind of show you eBird uh, is kind of from a birder's perspective, from my perspective, and then sort of show you what, you know, the, the scientists at Cornell Lab, Lab of Ornithology, which is a, you know, that group that uh, really has first organized this, how they make use of all this data. And, and there are two ways that you can, you know, as a birder, you can enter your sightings. You can either go on to the website version, which is this, and uh, log in to eBird, or, and, Now I just need to see if I remember mine. Because <laughs> he does it on his phone, right? Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, okay, so when you log in as a birder, you can um, you know, submit your list, and, and, then, uh, and then you can choose your location uh, or find it on a map. And so I can say, uh, let's see, well, first of all, Larimer County. Zooms in, and then you can uh, find something a little more specific, like CSU Environmental Learning Center. And these are all predefined hotspots that uh, you know that uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology, based on you know how many different specific reports have come in, and then it'll give you a specific location, and then you can select this. 
say that that's where you, I select it. And then you enter this specific data, like, like the, uh, the observation date. So this is a way that you can not only enter like today's sightings, but you can go back in time as far back as you had, uh, you know, like index card records like I used to do. <laughs> um, and, and I've actually gone back and I've entered all those, and there are, well, at least a lot of those. And, uh, you know, so going back That's to... That's long, right? <laughs> yes, it was. It took me most of Christmas break. Um, and, and then it's observation type. So, uh, and there are five different, well, yeah, five different categories. One is that you're, you're traveling, I mean, you're like out for a hike, or you're driving on a, you know, National Wildlife Refuge tour, or, or you know, driving loop or something like that. You're not standing still and birding. The other is stationary, like you're at your backyard bird feeder, or maybe you're at a, a sea watch point, you're out on a, you know, a point on the land that juts out into the sea and you're just looking at what birds are moving by. Well, you're the school ground. Yeah. Yes, so, I'm just trying to think this relevant. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. Um, and, and then the historical, which, you know, again, if you're entering paper records that you're, or uh, Excel records or whatever, format that you had collected however many years in the past, but you can't uh, estimate what the, or you don't know exactly when the start and stop date uh, times were, or you don't remember how many individuals of each species that you saw, things like that. Um, and then uh, you can say continue. Oops, I guess I needed to make you choose the see one of those things, and I do need to pick a date too, so. Let's just say it was a few days ago, and I'll just say that well, I'm kind of, you know, let's just forget that. Let's just say it's historical, and um, I don't remember any of those details. And then it gives you a list um, of all the possible different bird species that uh, that are present at the CSU Environmental Learning Center. And so these are uh, this list of species that are. Uh, you know, broken, broken apart by you know taxonomic category and taxonomic order. You know, so you start off with ducks, and then you go through um, yeah, ducks, and then pheasants, and geese, and grebes, and great blue herons, and eagles, and hawks, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And and you can uh, you know specify to ask it to show rarity. So if if you saw some a rare species of you know, say that you saw a brant, which is a you know, kind of kind of similar to a Canada goose, but uh, but they're primarily found on the Atlantic coast or the sometimes the Pacific coast. I mean, they're very rare here, but there's always a chance that you could have seen that. And uh, so then, uh, if you do that, so if we say that, oh yeah, I saw three of those, it's going to immediately question it or ask you to provide more documentation. <laughs> um, well, at least one side hit submit so I'll just say yes that's all that I saw and and okay so that that warning was that okay well you certainly saw more species than just one so <laughs> <laughs> but then it's going to say uh, because that was rare that I need to provide some sort of documentation so either a description like how did I identify it as that bird and not a Canada goose um, and ideally, if I had a, a, a photograph or a video or, or a sound recording, uh, you can enter all those things in here. Yeah. So like, um, I, I was recently in Tucson, and my wife thought she saw a pretty rare hummingbird there, mm -hmm. and she got really good little video of it. Yeah. Would she have to um, then change the file size before she uploaded it, or does um, it change it for Yeah, it? so if it was a video, let's see, I mean, you can, I mean, I think the max size is uh, with saying uh, 10 megabytes, oh, so if okay. it was less than that, then you're fine, but uh, yeah, otherwise you'd have to, you have to change somehow it condense it or trim it or something. Okay. Um, but, but so this is a, the mechanism which eBird, uh, you know, allows you to provide documentation for a rare species. And 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 so um, and so that brings up a, you know, a, some of the points that Greg was making earlier about um, uh, 
you know, documentation and verification, kind of validation of the of the records that are that are uploaded. And let me see if I go into my email here because eBird has a whole squadron of people that are or basically function as editors. And so if you post a rare bird, then um, they will uh, and and if you didn't provide satisfactory evidence, they will send you an email. And they're quite good about doing that. So um, let me see if I can find an example here. And this is one reason that sometimes scientists will say, professional scientists will say, well, we don't want to use the data of citizen scientists because it's not actually you know, accurate. And really, the research shows that if the protocols are pretty clear, that citizen science data are actually very similar. There's no uh, uh, significant difference between the data they collect and the data that the academic scientists collect. And so, but some of the programs are a little more sophisticated. So eBirds has money, right? I mean, they're they're like a big operation. They're well, they have a lot of and people post, that donate. They yeah, it's a poster child of, of citizen and, science. But plus, there's so many birders around the world. There's so, and they're birders that have been around since the 1700s, and because many of those birders were originally the people who also colonized many parts of the world, then they like they sent off their. I'm just saying this because it's like mostly the British. The British were in India. So anyway, so they so they've like converted a lot of the world to be birds. So there are birders all over the world, and so you know I think it's just they have come up with uh, the protocols of how do you verify. They know, okay, upload a picture or upload the description. How do we know that you know the difference between a Canada and a Bram, you know, uh, goose? And so, but this is and, and so if you're a teacher, some of these things are built in. I'm just saying that it's it's nice. Yeah. You don't have to like I'm not a birder. Can I use this? It's kind of built in there. And so this was a, actually the, the American Dipper example. Oh. So I got an email from eBird, like, uh, you know, because I, uh, I actually, well, the other thing I didn't mention, uh, there's an app, wonderful app version. Um, and, and this is the way most people enter their records as they're out birding. And I was trying to uh, put this on the screen, but I, um, I'm not quite sure how to do that, but uh, to show this. but. Um, but it's actually quite nice that, uh, but you can start a new checklist and then you can select a location from a map and use the GPS in your phone to zoom in to exactly where you are. Is it a free app? Yeah, it's right. a free app. I'm just saying so that your students can do this. And, you know, all you have to do is set up a, you know, a free account and, uh, and, and it's having a hard time, I think, because I... It's, it's so what did they say about the American Dipper well, Talk? Um, oh yeah, the, the American Dipper. So, so they were, I mean it wasn't the fact that we saw a Dipper, it was the fact that when I used eBird on my phone, it gave me the option of designating a subspecies. And yeah. this email was saying, Dear, hello Paul, I wanted to let you know why this record was flagged in case you're curious, multiple American Dippers are in the list. Definitely not rare to find on a suitable mountain stream or river as in the case of this checklist. However, the subspecific identification of the Northern Dipper is fairly difficult. Also, the northern group is only is the only expected subspecies of the dipper to occur in North and Central America. Um, anyways, I it, because I had designated a subspecies kind of by default, uh, this fellow uh, Sean Walters was was questioning how did I arrive at that identification, and then I had a couple email exchanges with him and kind of cleared it up. And, Remove that. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, because I, I couldn't. Um, but, but anyways, I mean, the point here is, is that they eBird is is very good about uh, uh, their various um, protocols. Uh, flag, you know, that they flag records that are suspicious, and whether or not you're entering a historical record or uh, or a current record. I mean, guaranteed. They'll, you know, if you didn't provide enough information, they'll follow up with you. So kind of sometimes people call it like ground truthing. Yeah. I, mean, yeah, sure I, might, I might add to that a little bit because I, I, I just didn't think about adding it. the most important slide of the whole talk, but that's the data quality question. Yeah. How, how can we be certain that the information is of high quality? Yeah. And it just, so eBird uses several methods of which we'll see many of them. Expert validation, this is that. So basically an expert is reaching out to you, a regional expert, it's a volunteer, but they're still reaching out to you and saying, hey, how do you know? Photo verification is another one. Repeated measures right. is another one that's mm -hmm. very common in citizen science. So the Farmer Inspector Project has two teams of 
no, three teams of two volunteers measure the same sites in close sequence to each other mm -hmm. of time. So they're assigning sites of volunteers to the same sites, and then they're corroborating each other's evidence to say what how the pipe is there or not, right? So repeated measures is another one. Um, outlier detection. Ebert has great algorithms to look at outlier detection. So they'll look at the the known facts of where the birds might be, as Paul's talking about, and say, well, the, that doesn't look like it would be there. So right. we're going to flag it in an automatic way as an outlier, and then follow up and try to make sure. Right. So they're exactly. building it's like your knowledge. Heart. It's like artificial intelligence, really. Yeah, so as far as repeated measures, I mean, a great example right now is that there's a, a pretty unusual bird and uh, in the just at the corner of Prospect and I-25, Harris Hawk, which is, you know, is normal ranges, southern Arizona, the, the valley, the lower Rio Grande Valley in Texas, and it's very unusual to see it in Colorado. But, but uh, when you go, if you wish to, you can go up there and <laughs> probably find it. I mean, because it's been hanging around since December 10th. Um, and it's uh, you know, and if you record it in eBird, then they probably won't follow up with you because so many other birders have recorded it, and it's it's a well documented the, bird. The other thing with eBirds is that there are some people who are kind of uber super birders, and they're like, oh, if Dave Carpenter, but there's some, or not Dave Carpenter, um, who's that Leatherman, you know, uh, uh, you know, they'll they're more likely because he's built up that reputation. Of being. Um, Right, and so they're, they they might still ask them for verification, but they're you know they're yeah. people who are known in mm -hmm. to the eBird community. Right. And so I'm going to stop you for a second, Paul. Do you have something else? Well, I, I was just going to follow up with this one thing. <laughs> I mean about I was okay, so, 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 oh, okay, so yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just wondering if there's a total count of entries so far. Like oh, how geez. long? Yeah, the, the, yeah, there is, and I'll show you. How long it's, has this site been up? Um, I think it's been. Uh, it's 2007. Yeah, that's probably around one. Right. And it's something like, I'm just taking a bit of a guess here, something like 34, 35 million lists that have been entered. And then, of course, each of those lists may have anywhere from just a couple species to 150 species. So. Right, there and are then, like 10,000. What are, what's the. So in North America, there are like 900,000. Well, well, around the world, there are something like 10,300 10, species of birds. Right. Um, so you've got a lot of work to do. You only have like what, twenty five hundred? Something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, I need to retire. <laughs> I need, I need, you need to get a pay raise so I can well, retire. I'm gonna let me. Yeah, we got to get before. Doing any kind of work in education is not like ruining the day. I just want to say that. So, so one okay. other point I want to make about this uh, validation <laughs> analysis is that I mean it will allow you to keep this uh, citing in your record even if eBird is not satisfied with it. And then so they have this, if you are not sure about the identification, please let me know. Without sufficient supporting details, the citing will be left as unconfirmed and therefore not included in the output for scientific analysis. But your personal records and lists will be kept intact. Yeah, so, so it may not be used by scientists, but you're like, no, I'm pretty sure this is what it Yeah, is. yeah. So, so, I mean, and so a big way that this whole, this works is that and there's so many birders out there that are really into keeping records, keeping lists. And this is a fabulous way of managing all those lists. So eBird is, you know, taps into that, all that enthusiasm, collects all this data, and is able to do all these amazing analyses, I mean, scientific analyses based with it. And so it really is kind of perfect and citizen so science. So a couple different ways um, as eBird's rack is racking up, because I want to just hand out one last handout, um, is that, so as teachers, you can use these data. Can you go back to yeah, the Yeah, and, and I want to show that, the, too. Because there are a couple things that you can, I'm trying to help you brainstorm how you might use these data. So let's say, um, I know Carol Singular actually took her, would take her students out, and um, I don't know if she had all her students enter these is eBird, but I think she did, right? And so we would see her, um, and what I would see her doing is looking, going through eBird to find places where there were some good birds, where it was dense with lots of species, so that when she did take her students, she knew, yeah. okay, just yesterday there were a lot of birds there. I'm, I'm pretty sure that things are going to hang around. So it was, it helped her as a teacher 
in one way. Yeah, and, and, and I'll show you some of these other ways that the student is used to. <laughs> Another thing that you can do is actually um, having students look at and, and make predictions about phenology, right? So how um, biological presence and behavior might change or be affected by abiotic factors, right? And sort of the timing of events. And so one thing you can do is, is people have used, teachers have used eBird to try to help their students understand that concept, especially if you're, so if you're teaching something like climate change, right? And you want some authentic data that your students can actually go in, collect these data, make some predictions, and actually have these data to, actually, to test their predictions. A third, I, a third example that my department chair just told me as I was coming down was he said, oh, I, I don't know much about eBirds except I know out east that um, house finches, right, they're very common feeder birds, which is nice because if you're at school ground, you can set up some feeders. Um, and he said they have this uh, disease, facial disease, this mycoplasma that, um, that infects them. And there's different gradients that people can record on eBird if it's a low infection, a high infection, or like the level of the tumor. And I said, oh, we have these birds in our backyard. We've seen these, these, these finches. It's really kind of sad. He said, oh, it's not really been, he goes, I just, we just read this, I just read this paper. I don't think it's been identified um, and documented out in Colorado. He said, this would be a great example for, for teachers um, or for undergraduates who think about students, undergrad students, to actually be engaged in this and to document the prevalence and where it is geographically around Fort Collins. And so those kinds of data, uh, those are all in eBirds. So these are some examples of how you can, you can use this if, in the event that you don't want to become a birder. And yeah, so, so there are, <laughs> a variety, I, and I don't know why you wouldn't be. No, I don't. <laughs> I became a bird in high school for a teacher. Paul had to wait, so I've been a birder longer than he is. He had to wait until he was in college, and, a, and it was one of his college instructors, so he took him out of birding. But for me, it was my seventh grade. Um, and we've gone, and Paul and I have gone out birding with him. He's retired with Mr. Homer, mm -hmm. Dr. Homer. So, anyway, so, so this is, um, so, so, so you can enter all those, uh, I mean, you can enter your lists, um, and then you can. Uh, you know, so these are different places around the world that have gone birding. So we've gone to India a few times. And you can zoom in. So these are different states within India. And then, and then uh, even different counties within that. So, I mean, and then, I mean it's, it's just mapped out all across the world. Uh, and so by automatically entering your sightings in, in your app, then it automatically gets transferred to, to this site. Um, there are, I mean, and then as far as how um, scientists can use this, I mean, you can, all of this eBird data, you can download. I mean, it's all publicly accessible. And so I'm not going to explore this because, you know, you have to, there's a little bit of a lag time uh, between when you request data sets and then when they actually deliver them to, to you. But, but there are other really cool things you can look at. Like there's some really cool modeling of like, a, uh, migration patterns like um, like uh, I don't think they have one for um, well here, here's you know, greater yellow legs which is the shore bird and and so this is uh, uh, you know just looking at its migration pattern from you know from uh, January all the way for, through the year and you can just see how they're mostly in South America and then they move back up. And, and so they have a few canned examples like this on eBird, but, but you can generate this type of data through, for every single species, basically. For, and, and so the other, the other point I wanted to make is that there are probably, um, let's see, if we go back to, let me see how best to go there. And there are, Has he converted anyone? Is anyone interested in birding? <laughs> yeah. Is anybody interested in e-birds and using this as a tool? Oh, my, wife, my wife joined us in a second. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the power, you, so you don't have to be a birder to, to go into this. I mean, I think, uh, I think when, um, what I'm trying to help translate here from Paul's presentation is that you can use this as a, a repository. I mean, what helped seeing sitsi.org is that there are lots of different things, but when you go into 
dive deeper into one, you can sort of yeah. see all of the types of um, nuances. So modeling, for example, is one of you know one of those um, competencies, the STEM competencies listed in the in the next generation science standards. And so, and then this is a list of you know very scientific publications that have used this uh, uh, used eBird data to answer scientific questions. That's the, I mean, mm -hmm. so it's advancing science, but fostering the hobbyist who wants to do checklists. So right. it's a, a mutually beneficial yeah. endeavor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. really is. And then when you get a scientist who's also a hobbyist, then it's just what's so exciting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so I, I'm, I'm really going gonna, gonna to stop because I want to hand out something to everyone. So I just want to ask any Let's thank Paul. Thank you. Any questions?